seeking God's will. That's all. But also on the same thing is a place to fill out where we'll have your information so we can send you a bill. I mean, <laughs> send you a letter for coming and being with us today. Just seeing if y'all was listening, you know. So fill this out for us, please. Put it in the offering plate when the ushers come forward uh, so that we'll have it tomorrow night for our outreach and that we'll have a record of your attendance today. Uh, youth Impact will be August the 29th and 31st. I know Brother Paul got the youth pumped up about that. So they'll be going to that. Pray for those. Our children's choir starts next Sunday or this Sunday? Sunday after Labor Day. Oh, Sunday after Labor Day. Yeah. So we'll get our kids fired up for that. Uh, we've got a new church directory. I see everybody signing up. We'll be running out of slots if we don't. Get out there and get signed up quick. We want everybody included in this directory. So sign up, pick a date and a time. Uh, they're going to make another trip to South Louisiana. All the goods we sent down the other day was really appreciated. And uh, so if you want to make a donation, we'll be storing them in the fellowship hall. Brother Wayne has an announcement. Okay. Building the grounds to have a quick committee meeting a day at 4.30. Is there any other announcements I need to make? promises. i 
time if you guys will come and uh, we're going to pray together also it's an opportunity for you to ask for prayer if you'd want to stand quietly where you are we'll gather around you and pray for you uh, we want to take this opportunity to give you that opportunity to request prayer is there anyone okay good miss candy over here some others some of you guys and you ladies over here pray for them if you would 
Maybe you want to come to the altar and pray at this time. It's a good opportunity for you to do that. Would you bow with me? Father, this morning as we gather in this place, Lord, we've sung songs of worship unto you, but God, we also recognize that, Lord, you've been so good to us this week. You've given us the help that's allowed us to be here this morning. You've given us a nice, dry, cool facility to meet in today. And God, we just have so much to be thankful for. And Lord, this morning as we meet here, God, in this time of prayer, some have stood and said they need prayer today. And God, we don't know what all their needs are, but God, you do. You tell us you know our needs before we even ask. So today, Lord, we call upon you for intervention in the lives of these. And Lord, I'm sure there's others who didn't stand this morning, who God need wisdom from you and guidance. God, some who maybe need healing. Maybe some need healing in their family, some in their bodies. God, some maybe need a financial blessing. Whatever it may be, Father. God, may, may their needs be seen and met according to your perfect will this week. And God, just as these who've stood and we pray for them this morning, God, meet their need. Meet them at their point of their need, God. Glorify yourself in their lives in whatever way you choose to do that. Help each of us, Lord, to get to that place in our life where we're able to say, as long as God's will is done, as long as he's glorified, I'm satisfied. And Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in their lives and each of our needs today. And Lord, even at this time of offering, God, this act of worship where we give to you. God, your people have always brought sacrifices to you. Today we give sacrifices that are financial. Lord, some have given sacrifices this week that are physical. God, whatever it may be, however way we show you that we love you. Today, God, receive our worship because you are worthy to receive it. And it is in Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
You know, let's stand one more time. You know, it's never too late for God to work in this city. You just got to get out there and tell everybody. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one. There is no one like our
Well, thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate his willingness to come and sacrifice and lead us here as we worship the Lord. I hope that you enjoy worshiping here. Our children will be going out to Children's Church at this time. While they do, that announcement's for the children, but I have an announcement for you senior adults who went off and showed out over there at eating out last night. We didn't have time to get y'all's pictures up on the screen, but I could see them being worked into a sermon here in the near future. <laughs> well, I don't have any doubt about that either. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, they, I, I'm worried. I don't, they wasn't supposed to have been drinking, but the way they was acting, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> but they kind of carried away over there. Listen, we Baptists, we don't believe in having fun. You got to have that serious frown on your face, look all reverent and stuff, you know. All right, it is good to see you today here in the house of the Lord, and uh, we're glad you're here. I like that song, Greater Things Are Still To Be Done. And I don't know whether we're in a city or not, but uh, maybe we should replace city in this church, amen, <laughs> in this church. God is doing some great things here, and I know you look around today and see new faces and people God is bringing here, and we're just excited about what God's going to do. If we can just keep us out of the way, amen? <laughs> I've always said, Lord, just keep me out of the way. I heard about a little boy went to church one time, and, and he kept saying, he said, uh, he said, Mama, he said, who's that man keeps, keeps me from seeing Jesus? They had a picture of Jesus back there in the, on the wall, and the, the little boy was sitting there, and the preacher was standing between him and Jesus. And I'll tell you, you don't ever want to be the person that keeps people from seeing Jesus. Amen? And uh, that, that's the way it is with us. We want to make sure that we don't do that, that we uh, help people see the Lord. And uh, in all that we do, let's, let's show people the Lord. And let's just stay out of the way and let God have his way here in our church. And uh, so good to see you. I'm having a good time preaching. Whether y'all are enjoying listening to it or not, I have a good time preaching. I got started preaching last week. Had five little old points, didn't get but two of them done. So we're going to finish the last three this week in your outline, in your bulletin this week. I don't know if Miss Penny filled the first two in or not. I hadn't looked at the bulletin this morning. Uh, but we'll be talking about how to live in Babylon. Where did I get that title this morning? Where did I get that title? Well, uh, that's what happened to the children of Israel. Over in Psalm 137, where we started last week, if you want to look there right quick before we go to Colossians chapter 3. But in Psalm 137, we see uh, uh, how the children of Israel had been taken away because of their sin. They were being held captive in Babylon. And in chapter 37, we see in verse 1, I'll just read it, you don't have to stand, I'll just read it and refresh your memory. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, he said, when we remembered Zion, or Jerusalem, or Israel. He says, we hung our harps up, these Jewish boys did, in the willows of the midst of it, and there, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and wanted us to sing to them, and they said, and, uh, and those who plundered us requested mirth or laughter and joy. And we sang this morning about that joy. But he said, sing of us one of those old songs of Zion. And they said, here's what the Jewish boy said, how shall we sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? They'd lost their song. Now, three different times in the book of the Psalms, and once in Revelation 5, it says, uh, it speaks about singing that new song. You know, when you, when you got the Lord in your heart, God gives you a new song. Amen? I'm going to tell you the old songs. Uh, you, you find yourself with, you know all the words to the old secular songs. But I'm going to tell you, when you get Jesus in your heart, you'll get some Jesus songs in there. Amen? You'll get some praise in your heart. And you'll want to sing a different tune, if you will, uh, in this life. Not a negative tune, not a downcast tune, not a defeated tune, but a new tune. The children of Israel had lost that song in their heart because they were in a foreign land, different values, different beliefs. Well, America's changing today. America's becoming a little bit like a, a land that we would have considered foreign 50 years ago, a little different nation, still the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but it's changing, much like the world is changing, you know, and sadly, a uh, whole nation's becoming a little bit more like California and New York, and... Uh, I'm sorry if you came from California and New York, didn't intend to offend you there, 
uh, but you can come apologize to me later. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but no, it's just a joke. Lighten up. It's just a joke. All right. But, uh, but it's so important that we understand our world is changing a little bit and our values, uh, we're being told to change our values. Keep your faith in the church and uh, stop, stop trying to make it public and make other people believe what you believe. And, and then our, we're having a lot of our freedoms, our religious freedoms taken away. So, and it could cause us to lose our song. In fact, it could cause us to lose our joy. And you know, never should we allow this world to rob us of our joy. Never should we allow this world to rob us of our victory song. I think about Moses and them. They sang that song of redemption when God had set them free. And they'd crossed the, the Red Sea. And they crossed it on dry ground. And then God drowned the Egyptian army. And they sang a song of redemption, how God had delivered them. I'm going to tell you, we got a song of redemption to sing. This whole world may hate us. And they may kill us one day. They may try to destroy us. But I mean, we still got a song of redemption we can sing. It's amazing how we sit around and talk about what we don't have instead of thanking God for what we do have. And, and if the devil wants to steal your joy, folks. He wants to steal your song. And so today I want to talk about some things, some realities of our faith that we need to be claiming, some things that we need to be walking in so that we don't lose our song and our victory and our celebration and so today, as we look at these verses, I'm going to turn back to Colossians chapter 3 now, and I want to talk to you about how not to lose that song, as the children of Israel had done. And there in verse 1, if you'll stand with me in honor of the reading of God's holy word, I want to read those first four verses of Colossians chapter 3, and notice what it says, and by the way, we stand in honor of God's holy and inerrant and infallible word of God. And what that means is it's the perfect Word of God. Amen? And so he said, If then you were raised with Christ, then those th seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, it says, on things above and not on the things of this earth. I want to challenge you this morning. Take a pen or a highlighter or something. And that verse 2, I want to challenge everybody here to memorize that verse. That's one of those verses that I have uh, recited and memorized in my heart. And you ought to work on that this week. You ought to make a postcard out of it and stick it on your refrigerator or your mirror. And you ought to work on memorizing that verse. And that ought to be kind of a life verse for you. And for me, if you're a believer, set your mind on things above. I'm telling you, when you get up in the morning before you go to work, and you know you're going to have a hard day at work. Maybe there's somebody there that rubs you the wrong way. Your boss doesn't treat you well. The Bible says set your mind on things above. Amen. Understand that you're not living for this world. You're living for heaven. You're living for the Lord. Set your love, set your joy on the things above. And stop complaining about the things of this earth. Let it go. Let it go and let God do a fresh work in your life. And, uh, and he says, not on the things of this earth. In other words, think about the positive things, the ways God has blessed you, instead of always looking at the negative things and what you didn't get in life. And verse 3 says, for you, why, how can you do that? For you died, period. I said, we could put a period there, couldn't we? You died when you gave your life to Christ. You may have thought you just joined the church. I'm going to preach my sermon reading through this verse here. But you may have thought you just joined the church. But the Bible says when you come to Christ, you died. Remember that. Remember that. The old you died. And you were raised to be a new person. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is also is our life, appears, you're going to appear with Him in glory, the Bible says. Well, that gives you a reason to have a positive outlook, doesn't it? You know how it ends. What a good news story that is. Father, take the reading of your word today. Speak to us about it, in it, through it. God, help us to walk in victory. Help us to walk in our faith. And not to just talk about our faith on Sundays and not live it seven days a week. Not to walk in the power of it. Teach us today, Father, that we may, that we may better understand who we are in Christ and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen, you may be seated. This old world's not our home. 
where drug use is rampant and alcohol is flourishing and families are failing and, and, and really terrorism is, is uh, invading civilization and there's terror. One of the verses as we study on Sunday nights as I'm teaching you about some of the last day's signs and some of the things we see in the end of time, one of the things tells us that in the last days there will be those who will try to, to impress their values on us using terror, the Bible says. It says they will be terrorist uh, in the latter days. And so we see that as one of the realities of the world which we live in. But 1 John 5, 4 says that God, Jesus tells us in the scriptures that he's overcome the world and that you and I should overcome this world. And it says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 that we will overcome this world through faith. Faith. What is faith? Faith is believing that God is and that God will do what He said He will do. Now, if God is, do you believe God is? Do you believe God is the creator of the world? He created everything, everything that contain, continues and consists because of Him. Do you believe that God can do anything? Do you believe that the same God who created this world came born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on an old rugged cross, rose from the dead three days later, ascended back to the Father 40 days later, and is coming back to this earth one day to get us? If you believe that, my friend, I'm here to tell you everything else pales in comparison. Amen? If you believe that that God who can do anything, the Bible says that nothing is impossible with God. He can do greater things, the Bible says, even than you can even think about. And that's a lot. I can think about some stuff. Amen? I can think about some stuff. But it says He can do greater than I can even think about, the Bible says. So if you believe that about God, if that is your God, that kind of faith says, no matter what happens in this world, you may have health problems. You may struggle with your children sometimes being a little bit rebellious. You may struggle with financial issues in your life. You may go through some hardships in your life. But I'm here to tell you, life is so brief compared to eternity. And when you think of life compared to eternity, it's like the blinking of the eyes, the snapping of the fingers. The Bible calls it as like one grain of sand on a seashore of all the sand. It's like one star compared to all the stars of the skies. Oh, my friend, eternity is nothing. It is so much, I should say, compared to the nothingness of life. And therefore, many times we find ourselves so focused on trying to get ahead in this life instead of trying to get ahead with God. The Bible says if you've got treasures to store up, make sure you store some up in heaven. Amen? You've got to live off of eternity in those things that you store up in heaven. And God says, store up treasures in heaven where the moth and the rust not going to get it, and you're not going to leave it to somebody else. I'm telling you this, you're not going to take it with you. You're not going to take it with you. So God says, make sure, and I'm not saying you can't have anything. You've got to give everything away. That's not what I'm saying at all. But make sure you invest your life in eternity, in heavenly things, and not just the things of this earth. Here's some promises that you need to hang on to, understanding who you are so you don't lose your song. The first one I said last week was our position. Understand your position in Christ. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you stay with God, where you stand with God? It says in that first verse there, it says, If you then were raised, it's a hypothetical. It could say, since you have been raised with Him. Since you already have conquered the grave by your faith. Did you know your faith has made you an overcomer of this world? Did you know that faith gives you victory in this world? Understand that you have victory. Paul cried out that he could just know that resurrection power of Christ. Understand who you are. You have been placed in Christ, it says there. Your life is safe in Him. So understand that today. Understand the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. You have been raised with Him. The grave, you know what the Bible says Jesus did over in 1 Corinthians 15? It says he conquered death. He, he literally destroyed death. Death no longer has sting. The grave no longer has a poison for you. I'm here to tell you, the Bible, Jesus said, if you believe in him, if you have faith in him, you'll pass from death to life, the Bible says. So understand that. You don't have to fear death today. One old boy said, he said, I don't fear death. 
He said, I just fear them last few seconds before death. Amen. <laughs> well, how's it going to come about? We don't know. But I'm here to tell you, when we die, we don't have to worry about, about eternity and what happens next. The second thing I want you to see is your passion for Christ. We talked about that last week in the last part of verse 1. He said, not only do you need to understand that you, are, you were raised with Christ, you are a resurrected believer. Understand who you are with Christ. It says that you need to seek those things which are above, much like that second verse. I want you to, he says, to seek out, to set your heart for the things of God. What is your heart set for? What motivates you? What inspires you? You know, a lot of folks in this old world, they're, they're motivated, they're inspired, they're passionate about various things. A person can be passionate about sin. They can be, all they can think about is whether they can get another drink or I saw an old buddy and the guy I grew up with in the store this week, and he was buying, a, I guess you'd call it a half a case of beer or whatever. It's 12 cans of beer, and it's about 5.30 in the afternoon, and I told him, I said, hey, and I called his name. I said, man, let me ask you. He knows I'm a preacher, been preaching my whole life. I said, let me ask you something. Now, that 12 cans of beer right there, that's going to last you the rest of the week. And this was like Wednesday. He said, no, it'll last till about dark 30. I thought there's somebody's consumed with alcoholic drink. I mean, from the time he gets off, all he can think about is drinking until he falls asleep. Some people it's drugs. Some people it's pornography. Some people it's the internet. I'm beginning to think some people it's Facebook. Amen. I mean, they, if they take a breath, they're looking on Facebook. You know, or whatever it may be. What is a passion of yours? What do you enjoy? Some people it's sports. God says it ought to be things above. Amen? It ought to be what inspires you. It ought to be what motivates you. It ought to be something you think about when you get up in the morning. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I hope you think about God more than just on Sunday morning. I hope you think about God every day. I hope the thought of God and the fact that you belong to God and what we're going to see this verse about you've died, that you belong to Him, I hope that that is something that is evident and something that's on your mind, something that's in your thought process all through this life, that you belong to God. And He has a plan for your life. Oh, do you know that? The Bible says that our job is to, to now to go out in the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in. And listen, folks, if we're not going to do that, if we're not going to go, as Jesus said, out in the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be full. Now, he was talking about a supper, but he was talking about that marriage feast of the Lamb. He was talking about that day that one day we're going to go be taken up to heaven, and we're going to, right now, we're betrothed to Jesus Christ. He's the groom, the church is the bride, and he's coming back for us one day when he's got our home prepared and he's going to take us to heaven where he's at and when he gets us up there we're going to have something called the marriage feast of the lamb and it is a wedding supper folks it means the bride of christ the church those who've been born again and and by the way the bride's not necessarily everybody's name that's on the church roll it's not necessarily everybody's name is that's on the irs roll either it's folks who've been born again Folks who understand that they've died and He's God. You understand that? If you don't understand that you've died, that you came to the end of your life when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, and from that point on, your future is, is to serve Jesus, to follow Jesus, to obey Jesus. If you weren't willing to turn your life over to Him, my friend, you probably just joined a church. Now listen, folks, when I give an invitation, when God tells me to give an invitation and I lead out in that invitation, I'm never going to ask you, please come join our church. Please join our church. Because it doesn't matter if you're Baptist, folks. It doesn't matter if your name's on the church roll somewhere. In fact, some of you could testify to this. You joined a church before you joined Jesus. You, you joined a church. It was easy to join the church. In fact, it's easier to join the church than it is the Moose Lodge. I mean, the Moose Lodge will make you pay dues. We don't even make you pay dues. Maybe we ought to. I don't know, but we don't. You, you know, you can just come along for the ride here, you know, not pay a penny. We, we just invite you. If we, but if I'm inviting you to join the church, I'm inviting you to do the wrong thing. I want you to join Jesus, folks. I want you to come to Jesus. And, I, and when you come to Him, you end and He starts. 
You understand that? So that gives us to this next point, our priorities to Christ. That's the third thing in the outline, our priorities. You see, you have now been sent out on a mission with Christ. Verse 2 says, set that mind on things above. Do you understand that you're on mission with God? Henry Blackaby's got a great study out now called On Mission with God. You're talking about a good study. Uh, Brother Ray, that'd be a great study to do if y'all haven't done it at 5 o'clock. On mission with God, understanding that every day you get up and it's Monday morning and you're not through with church for the week. It's Monday morning and you're now going out on mission with God. I, I went to this church one time and when you go out the doors, there was a sign over the doors that said, you're entering the mission field. The sign was on the inside. So when you leave, you understand you're going into a mission field. You're not just going home, you're going to your mission on Monday morning, you go to your mission field. It may be as a carpenter or a plumber or a lawyer or a doctor, but you're going, you're going on your mission field. Wherever you are, God's planted you there. And so he says here, I want you to keep your mind on that, to understand your calling, understand why I saved you. Matthew 6, 33 says, set your, set your affections on things above. It, it says there that seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all this other stuff. In other words, let me put the Calhoun interpretation on you. And all this other stuff will work out. I'm going to change that. Calhoun's a long ways away. I call it the Okaloosa interpretation now. That's where I live, Okaloosa. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's the interpretation that says that, listen, get it right. Get your priorities right. Jesus first. And ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Your husband is supposed to love Jesus more than he loves you. You know that? And that doesn't mean you're not important. But I promise you this. If he loves Jesus the way he's supposed to, he's going to love you better than he ever has before. Right? Hey, children, he's supposed to love Jesus more than he loves you. But if he loves Jesus... He's going to be a great dad for you. But see, we got to get that part right. That's why Jesus said, you've got to love me more than anything else. That's our priority as a believer. I hope you understand that. But see, some people just came down the aisle. They didn't want to turn from their sin. They just wanted fire insurance. They didn't want to go to hell. They, they wanted a ticket to get them through the pearly gates. They, they didn't want to be washed. They didn't want to die to self. They didn't want to come to the end of their path with, with self and doing their own thing. They just wanted to join the church and get their ticket stamped for heaven. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can't come and join a church and forget the Lord. And just say, God, I, I, I'm not going to die to self. I'm not going to let you be in charge. I just, But I'm okay. I wish I could tell you over the years how many times I've talked to people. And they say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm okay. Well, I don't care about God. I ain't really got time for the things of God. I don't ever think about God. But I, my name's on church roll somewhere. Hmm. Billy Graham says maybe as high as 70% of church memberships not saved. Church membership. Now, that's church membership. Now, uh, we have 16 million Southern Baptists. Half of them, the FBI, don't know where they're at. <laughs> and we sure don't know where they're at. Amen? On any given Sunday, no more than about 6 million of them are in church. So something's not right there. Amen? Something's not right. So many times that happens because people join a church. Not always. Sometimes it happens because they join a church instead of joining Jesus. And so God calls us to, to get our priorities right, to reorganize, to restructure those priorities. In fact, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, uh, tells us actually that you're to present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. In other words, God's not really asking you to die physically. He's asking you to die spiritually to self, and yet just give yourself to God. I've got a sermon called, Would the Real Church Please Stand Up? 
And in that we talk about what it means to be a living sacrifice, to be sold out for God, that, that, that it's important for us to be transformed, he says in those verses, Romans 12, 2, transformed by renewing our mind. What does it mean to renew your mind? It means to not allow your mind to be so focused on this world and to be more focused on the things above. And that's the only way we're ever going to be a living sacrifice. Is we've got to understand it belongs to Him. I'm here to tell you, give your life away. I got another sermon there that says it's titled, Give Your Life Away. Man, give it away. And that's hard for us to do, isn't it? We say, well, I only get to go around once. Well, that's a beer commercial. I don't need to use that. I'm going to reword that. You only go around once in life, so be drunk the whole time you're going. But, but the fact is, people say, well, I've got to hang on to my life. I've got to have as much fun as I can. I've got I to gotta do it my way because I'm going to die one day. Let me tell you something. For the believer, when you die, you just went through the worst part. It's fixing to get better and better and better. For the unbeliever, when you die, you better have fun. Because it's fixing to get worse and worse and worse. Now, you, you, have, you have fun for that long. The Bible says sins are pleasurable for a period of time, for a short time. But then there's a payday. Payday someday. R.G. Lee preached that old famous sermon. Not, not R.G. Lee, J. Harold Smith. One and a half million people saved by him preaching that sermon. Payday someday. You're going to pay for that. No, that was God's free deadlines he preached. R.G. Lee was payday someday. But it's just a challenge to understand that there's going to be a day. When your priorities, when you'll kneel before God and you'll acknowledge that He's the Lord, whether you want to or not, you're going to acknowledge it. But for some folks, it's going to be too late. The Bible says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, but you know what? If you do that now, you get a home in heaven. But if you wait and do it when you have to do it, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. Number four, our plight with Christ. What is our plight? What is our future? What is our plan with Christ? Maybe I should have used there. For you died. That is our plight. If you, if you give your life to Christ, if you, you, you have to understand what's involved in that. Is involved in that is death. Your life was hidden there with Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, uh, What? Know you not that you are not your own? That you have been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, it says. But it says glorify God in your body, which is God's. You see, there's something called repentance. When you walk down that aisle, Miss McCartney, and this person walks down that aisle, and they take, they take that preacher by the hand, and they pray a prayer. And, and I'll tell you, sadly, in a lot of our churches over the years, people have walked down the aisle, and the preacher has said, they said, I want to be saved. And sadly, for a lot of years, I know I've had people tell me these stories. People said, oh, that's wonderful. Sit down here and fill out a card. Folks, there's a difference in wanting to be saved and being saved. Sadly, sometimes preachers have done wrong when they didn't tell people, when they didn't, didn't explain to people what's involved in being saved and explain to them that, that we have to understand that we're a sinner and that we have to be willing to repent of that sin. That means that we acknowledge that we were wrong and we're sorry about our sin, but that repent means that we're willing now to turn from that sin where we're God and we're doing our own thing, and now I want to go toward God, and I want God to be in charge of my life. And folks, that's salvation. Please know that's salvation. And maybe you've been questioning your salvation for a lot of years, and i talked to a lot of people over the years who questioned their salvation. And one of the th reasons I find that a lot of times is because some people were just told to fill out a piece of paper. 
And they never prayed and asked Christ to come into their life. They never repented of their sin. And there's not magic words. I'm not saying that you've got to say abracadabra and all these magic words to be saved. But there's definitely got to be a condition of your heart that changes ownership. Are you with me? There's a change of ownership. And that's why a lot of people have really have doubts about their salvation because they still, they know how selfish they've been with their life for so many years. They've been selfish. They've done what they wanted to do. They just went to church on Sundays. And they didn't really care what God thought. The Bible says you, need to, you and I need to understand that you're dead. Now, that sounds like bad news, doesn't it? But folks, that's great news. You know what that means? That all my effort and all my trying to save myself and all of being good and all of being God and all that stuff that I've been trying to do to maybe earn my way to heaven is none of it going to work. And I've got to just give my life away. You know what the Bible teaches us? If you'll give God your shame, He'll give you His glory. He'll give you his salvation he'll give you his forgiveness but you've got to be willing to give him your shame you've got to make a wonderful exchange with god he says i'll take your punishment and you take my salvation and walk in it but you got to walk in it i want to ask you friend are you walking in faith time is about gone are you walking in faith here's what i mean by that are you living what you believe you have a problem arises tomorrow. It's a health problem, let's say. You go see the doctor. The doctor says, I don't know, it really looks bad. You may have six months to live. I wish I could tell you how many times I've walked into a room and I've heard the bad news and I walk into a room expecting somebody to be maybe down and discouraged. And I walk in the room and they've got a big smile on their face. And they're saying, hey, preacher. I said, well, I heard you got some bad news. Ah, doesn't matter. It's all in God's hands. I'm not worried about it. I'm ready to go home. People that have victory over death. Or somebody says, I, you know, you find out on Monday morning you got some, uh, some family issues, maybe something going on. And, and, and it's hard and you, you feel the pain. Maybe a rebellious child or... Uh, a, a marital issue and and you know there's that temptation i'm amazed at the number of people sometimes when they go through a problem they quit going to church first thing they do is they quit going to church well i just got too many problems to go to church let me tell you something folks when you got problems run to the church amen don't stay away run to the church get somebody to open it up get on this prayer on this altar and cry out to god and then get up and say, hey, my future is in God's hands. I can't control every decision my children make. You do the best you can. You raise them to love God, to love Jesus. Let them see it in your, eye, in your eyes and in your life. But man, when it comes down to some of it, they're going to have to make their own decisions. Would it be okay if I say to you too, stop picking them up and carrying them all the time? You pick your children up and carry them all the time, they'll never learn how to fall down and get up on their own. Sometimes we do the worst things for our children. What if you had a little baby and you, you, you never let that baby walk? You just carried it all the time because you loved it so much. Well, it never learned how to walk. I learned a long time ago learning how to walk involves getting a lot of bruises and cuts on their head. But you've got to let them fall sometimes many times we don't want to do that but folks that's where faith comes in faith says god this person needs to go through your school of hard knocks you know sometimes you may have to let a spouse learn something the hard way you may have to say to them i love you and i'm praying for you but i'm here to tell you right now god's fixing to deal with you and i'm just going to keep a smile on my face and I'm going to sit back and wait on God to deal with you. I'm going to wait on God to straighten you out. Hey, folks, don't try to straighten everybody out. God hadn't died and made you God. Huh? 
God hadn't made you God. You can't fix everybody's problems. Stop trying to. Let God fix them. Let God work out their situation. That's where faith comes in. Faith puts a smile on your face and trust in your heart and says, I know God's got this. You see, when you're not living by faith, it's when you're saying, I ain't sure God's got this, so I got to fix this. God don't need your help fixing it. He just needs you to pray and to be there with an encouraging word, a testimony, a blessing. But let Him work it out. Listen, chances are He's not going to work it out like you'd work it out. (laughs) Otherwise, He'd made you God. I'm glad God don't let me work it out sometimes. Because I'm going to tell you something. Hey, some folks, I'd beat them, blow them up. Amen. I mean, they'd be picking up pieces. I'm telling you, it'd just be terrible. Because I wouldn't work it out. I'm not patient like God. Huh? And I don't have the knowledge and the wisdom that God has. I can't see around corners like God does. You see, when you start trying to work it out, you're saying, well, God don't know what I know about this. That's a lack of faith. That's a lack of faith. Because I promise you, He knows things about them that you don't even know. (laughs) You think you know everything, you don't know it all. But God does. And He knows how to make it happen. But you've got to wait on God. That's what faith is. Faith is waiting on God. Faith, acrostic, forsaking, all I trust Him. Not me. I don't trust me. I trust Him. The last one. Our potential through Christ. Verse 4. You will appear with Him. Hey, what's our potential? What? Man, I'm going to come back with the Lord in a glorified body. I'm going to come back with Him, and we're going to rule upon this earth for a thousand-year millennial kingdom, and He's going to use us in that process of ruling as He develops His kingdom on earth. Oh, I'm here to tell you something, friends. I'm going... It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say if He needs you. It doesn't say if He wants you. It doesn't say God's thinking about it. It says you also will appear with him in glory amen now i'm here to tell you something if that's not true you ought to go home burn this book if that if you can't trust that verse you can't trust nothing in here it doesn't say you might or god will think about it it says you will appear with him in glory if you've been born again oh my friend that's good news that's your potential If you're here this morning and you're lost, you're living in sin, you're doing things your own way, you haven't cared about God, maybe you're a member of a church somewhere, maybe you've been baptized. I've seen folks baptized so much they shrivel up like a prune. I've seen seen folks that have been baptized, they've been baptized in every baptistry in town. But I'm going to tell you, when Jesus gets a hold of them, they're different. A lot of folks say, well, I, I, I just, I know I'm not saved. Oh, deep down in your heart, has there been a time in your life when you knew that you'd been born again? I mean, you knew you died and Jesus became God in your life. He became the Lord. You're not perfect. You, you're never going to be perfect until he comes back and changes you and makes you perfect. But that's in actuality. In the mind of God... You're already perfect. You understand that? God sees you as complete. He sees you as finished. You're not there yet. But He knows what He's making you. He is shaping you. So what this means when you come back and and, and when you appear with Him, that means that God's through with you. He's finished you. So this morning, if you're here and you're still living in sin and you know you've had your back turned on God and and, and you know you wonder if God could even save you because you've been bad, I'm here to tell you this morning, your potential is to be made righteous. Your potential is to come back with Jesus and to rule and reign upon this earth. That's your potential. The question is, do you want to live up to it? 
Do you want to live up to your potential or you want to live down to your potential? I don't know about you, but I want to be everything God wants me to be. Some of us are just mediocre Christians. We've just decided if we can make a C minus, just like we did in school, if we can make a C minus and just get out of here, anybody, don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hand, Rachel. No, I'm joking. She's a, <laughs> she's the only student I still got in church, in school. So. She'll make a C on something, and I say, "What's up with that?" You want to just come up here and confess, Rachel, and tell everybody you're sorry for not studying hard when you don't do that? No, she's an honor student, but shh, it's about to drive me crazy. I'm too old to have a kid in high school. But you know what? It's so good. It's so good to know that you don't have to be a C minus Christian. You don't have to do just good enough to get by. Do you understand that He wants you to rule with Him? That He sees you as complete and perfect? Shame on us if the only time we think of Him is on Sunday morning. Shame on us. That's just, that's just sneaking by kind of Christianity. Understand who you are, folks. Understand your position in Christ. Understand that you're, you have been given the potential to, to rise above the crowd, above the world. Rise above the majority. And place your life in Christ. And get a new and fresh start. You've got to do one thing. God says to you this morning, I know you're a sinner. I, I know you've messed up. I know you're not where you need to be. But I'm reaching out to you, God says. I'm reaching out to give you the potential that will make you way ahead of most of mankind because the majority is not believers. He says, so I'm challenging you to, to take a step up. But God's not going to come all the way to you. He's not going to come to you and say, I'm making you come to me like some theology teaches, God's offering you forgiveness. He's offering you heaven. He's offering you eternity. He's offering you to appear with Him one day. He's offering you to come to the feast. He's offering you to go on mission with Him. But you've got to take a step out of that pew. And you've got to step toward God. And you got to say yes. And you got to decide for those, some of you here this morning that are already Christians, but, but you've been C minus Christians. You're just kind of thinking about God on Sunday and just kind of getting by. You need to step out too this morning and you need to recommit yourself to walk with Jesus, to seek first the kingdom of God and let all the other things fall into place. choice is yours would you bow with me the musicians come I know this as times change in our nation and in our world I'm not going to let them rob my song I'm not going to let them steal my victory and I'm not going to compromise with them either I'm going to stand with Jesus if it makes the whole world mad. We have to decide where we're going to stand. We have to decide that we are in Christ. We're going to set our minds on things above. And one day we're going to come back with Jesus. Man, I'm died. I'm hidden in Christ. I'm coming back with Him one day. Man, I'm going to live my life seven days a week. Like I've got a new Lord, a new master in my life. And I'm going to be in love with Jesus. Is that you this morning? If that's you this morning, you've never been saved, or if you're uncertain if you're saved, and you just want to make sure, would you come this morning? Say yes to Jesus. Say yes this morning to His Lordship. Let him have his way in your life. 
all across this room right now, I sense the Holy Spirit is working on hearts. I sense He's convicting of sin. Some of you as believers, He's calling you to a new level of commitment. Some of you He's calling to be saved. The question is, will you let Him have His way? Will you take that step of faith? With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand with us? All across this building, just praying. Jeremy, I want you to sing for us, but not everyone. I want us to just pray this morning. I just sense the power of God here in this place this morning. It's time to do business with God. Nobody's going to be looking around. It's a chance for you to come out and walk down this aisle and take me or Brother Ray by the hand and say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Maybe you want to come to this altar and kneel and pray. There'll be a deacon up here that you can come pray with that deacon if you want to. Or you can come find you a place here along the front and pray and get some things straightened out with God. Or pray for somebody. But you come on right now. Let God have His way for you. Maybe you need to join this church. Put your membership here with us. At, here at Washtenaw and you come and let God have His way. keeps it open by somebody moving you've got one last chance to come this morning. you know God has spoken to you but you've got to take that step of faith When our service ends this morning, we're fixing to close in prayer. If you'd say, Pastor, I, I really need to talk to you. I, I just got some things I need to get straight with God. And you just come by and see me and say, hey, can you call and maybe let's get together. You can come by the office or I can come by the house and be glad to sit down and talk with you about some things that maybe is on your heart. And uh, maybe you feel you need to do that first. Um, thank you for listening. I just think God was here this morning. I'm not sure we were totally obedient with God this morning and and everybody just did what God wanted them to do. Maybe you made decisions where you stand. I hope you did. Um, thank you for being here today. I hope you'll come. But you know what? Don't just come. Bring somebody with you. 
invite somebody. I see some new faces here this morning. A good friend of mine, Mitchell Hobbs. That he and I went to Riser Elementary together years ago. And uh, glad to see Mitchell here this morning. Um, you know, as we close this morning, I want to let you know about a couple things. First of all, our Sunday school teachers have a meeting today at 5. If you're an adult, the adult Sunday school teachers uh, have a meeting today at 5. Where at, Matt? Okay, just meet in the fellowship hall first at 5 o'clock. Okay? Uh, one other thing, you notice Randy got up walking around a little bit this morning. If you see a guy or two getting up walking around here at the church, a few weeks ago we, our men met together and something that came out here a couple of weeks ago, ISIS, this group ISIS, has announced now that they're going to start trying to attack churches in America. They're going to start trying to bomb or shoot in churches and whatever. And so we really felt like we need to be a little bit more cautious as a church. And particularly with our children in another building, the, the likelihood that somebody, some stranger could walk up and go over there and grab the kids. And so we're just thinking about strategy for security. And we've got five or six guys here in the church that said, hey, I'm willing to take a turn and just kind of get up and walk the campus some. Like we had a stranger walking around outside carrying a duffel bag last Sunday, and that kind of spooked us a little bit, you know. And so we're just trying to be more precautious. So if you see somebody walking around, you'll know what it's about, okay? You'll know that they're there for a purpose, and that's just to kind of protect us, keep our eyes open uh, so that nothing happens. And I don't foresee anything to happen, but uh, we do want to be at least have some eyes out and about so we're not all in here with our eyes closed and something bad going on with our children next door or anything, okay? All right, thank you for being here in the house of the Lord today and let's close uh, for prayer at this time okay scott would you mind closing us